Hello and welcome to this week's edition of The Front Page. I'm your host, Racing Post editor Tom Kerr, and we've got a packed show ahead of you because it's Grand National Week and we'll be covering all things Aintree over the next 30 minutes, but we'll also be covering a, a wide range of other stories which have occurred in a busy week, including the retirement of Aidan Coleman, uh, the tragic death of Stefano Kerchi, and some breaking news which we'll be bringing you in just a minute. Uh, for all of that, we obviously require an A-list panel, and thankfully we've got one today, including uh, to my left in the studio, our West Country correspondent, James Stevens. So welcome to you, James. Thanks so much. And on Zoom from Ireland, it is our Deputy Ireland Editor, David Jennings. Welcome, Dave. Good to be here, Tom. It's raining. It's raining again. Again. It's is it ever not raining? Is it ever not raining? Um, we I be... think 1963, I think, was the last time it didn't rain, I think, for a day. <laughs> it is depressing, and it's going to have a big impact on the Grand National on Saturday, and that is part of what we'll be talking about later in the show. But first up, we bring you some breaking news. Uh, the Jockey Club, Britain's biggest racecourse group, has announced prize money will fall over the next year by 1.5 million. Uh, that represents a £750,000 drop in the Racecourse Group's contributions to prize money with the rest made up of uh, levy top-ups and entry fees. The prize money fall follows a drop in attendances of over 10,000 at the Cheltenham Festival this year, which in turn was down by 50,000 from the record highs of 2022. Last month, the Racing Post revealed that the uh, online turnover on horse racing had fallen by an equivalent of 1.7 billion pounds in the financial year 2022-23, as the impact of affordability checks took their toll on the sport. James, in many ways, uh, today's announcement, although it will come as a shock to the industry, is almost something we've been expecting to see for a while. In, in some ways, prize money has defied gravity. When you consider the size of the turnover decline uh, that we've seen on the sport, um, and then more recently, the decline in attendances at the Cheltenham Festival. Yeah, it's a shock but not a surprise, isn't it, in many ways. Um, prize money is the, the key indicator, isn't it, of, of, of what the sport revolves around. It's, it's, it's how well the race course is doing, how well the sport's doing in terms of betting turnover. That then can go into prize money. And for an industry perspective, it is the actual central core of, of the whole system. It's what keeps the owners in the mm -hmm. game. It's what funds the trainers, the jockeys. It, it's the most crucial part of it. And, and, and all the outside factors will impact it and it will have a knock-on effect. It's the key thing that really bridges race courses and betting turnover towards the industry. That's their, that's their key meat and that's the key point you can evaluate how the sport is performing. Um, yeah, affordability is a huge issue. We've, we've mentioned it so many times in here and of course the reason of that is because it will have a detriment effect to betting turnover which goes into prize money and then the industry suffers because of the consequence. This is the proof. I mean we've We've written so much about affordability in the last few weeks and we've had the Westminster Hall debate where a lot of the MPs said the impact it will have. This is the proof. This mm. is what has been happening. And it's not a surprise. We've had it in the newspaper. We've heard so many people across the industry recognise voices saying this is what's going to happen. So, no, it's not a surprise. Um, Cheltenham, really interesting subject. Last time I was here, we discussed the Cheltenham Festival and that attendance drop. I mean, they, they have blamed the cost of the living crisis, but... And they've also um, interestingly blamed affordability of Cheltenham itself, which I found was quite an interesting line, given that um, the Cheltenham Festival's whole experience is a lot more expensive than it used to be. And look, if people aren't coming to the Cheltenham Festival, it has a massive impact on the Jockey Club um, because it's not just ticket monies, it's, it's food when you're there, it's drink when you're there, it's, it's that whole process. And, and if every person is spending well over £100, which you can expect, there's no surprise that it's going to hit their budget. So it's a from a prize money perspective, it's an example of what affordability is doing. From a Cheltenham perspective, it is that another sign that all the things that the punters and our readers, and we've been saying here about Cheltenham perhaps being too expensive and there are too many issues that why people aren't going, 
that's now the evidence the Jockey Club have and they possibly might have to think about what they can do to, to change that in the future. Yeah, it really illustrates the critical yeah. importance of Cheltenham Festival to the Jockey Club and to horse racing more generally, both from a sporting perspective but from a uh, more prosaic point of view, from yeah. a financial perspective. Because let's remember, it was only in January that the Jockey Club announced prize money for mm -hmm. this year. So clearly at that point, they'd grappled with the implications of declining turnover, they'd grappled with the implications of affordability, and they'd set out their store what they thought was an affordable level of prize money. Still, in real terms, when you account for inflation, mm. uh, an area under severe pressure, but then to have this announcement just a few months later illustrates how badly Cheltenham under, underperformed expectations. And indeed, when I say badly, that might only be a few percentage points. Yeah. But Cheltenham is such a cash cow for the sport. It's so critical to everything the Jockey Club does that any underperformance, especially when everything else is so tight, then leads directly to prize it, it, money. It massively exaggerates it, doesn't it? Because it's the Cheltenham Festival, the small little impact it might have completely exaggerates it. And I think what this is, is it's another alarm bell for, for the sport, more than just the Jockey Club and the Cheltenham Festival and, and affordability. This is, this is not a surprise in the sense of, um, it's just the Jockey Club having this. This is happening across the board of attendances and there's some of those key fixtures uh, outside, I mean, you, you, for example, um, there was a lot of talk after the King George about that attendance dropping mm. and, and meetings like, like that. So it's not a huge surprise that those attendances are down. And, and as you say, Cheltenham exaggerates it. So when it's, when it's a drop at Cheltenham, it's so important it has such a knock-on effect. And, and, and as it will to, you know, Cheltenham itself, I mean, that is such a key... That's, that's the one point I've read on this story from West Country and Cheltenham perspective is that they're aware of the difficulties in Cheltenham. That's, that's the first time I can remember Cheltenham actually turning around and saying, you know what, we might have a bit of a problem here with the town. Because the accommodation in Cheltenham, the prices to go out, it has completely changed the dynamic and it's one of the huge um, issues that people have talked about in the town since you know, I've and been, we've spoken in this show. We have spoken a about this times. It's, it is the, the cost it, of attending it's, it's, and staying in Cheltenham the, the heart of yeah. the atmosphere is astonishing. It's mad and obviously I'm very dedicated to the show so I was doing some market research in the pubs of Cheltenham this weekend <laughs> um, and for them it's, it's really difficult because there's nothing they can really do about what the hotels are doing but it's impacting their business because mm. people are going well you know what it's too expensive so I'll either drive which a lot more people have done um, obviously getting out of a car park wasn't so delightful this year but it's, um, it's a more of a creeping theme within what's happening at Cheltenham. But also, um, people who have stayed, uh, stayed in further afield, Birmingham, Bristol, and trained in, and then they've had a bit of pressure to get their trains, so they've, they've left early and avoided the pubs. So there's whole different things that have happened. Let's, let's turn to yeah. the impact of this prize money reduction. 1.5 million um, in the grand scheme. Um, it, it, it's, it's only a few percentage points of mm. the prize money total. Uh, for the Jockey Club race courses. However, it's going to impact the uh, Jockey Club Chief Executive Nevin Truesdale has told the Racing Post um, uh, the sort of second tier races. So not they're going to protect the Grip Ones and they're going to protect their, their their most famous pattern races, but the sort of races which are uh, slightly lower down are going to be hit. Now, obviously that means the sort of the grass roots is protected and the very top tier is protected. But 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 that does mean that this sort of critical middle tier, yeah. which supplies so many of the, the, the premier handicappers, so many of the sort of listed and, and, and group three horses, and which has been under so much pressure in recent years with horses um, being sold to race abroad, is gonna take another hit. Yeah, and reading some of the, premium, the five premier meetings in front of me, a lot of those are, are jumps. And it's going to be as you these are the premier meetings which are going to be dis which are going downgraded. to be downgraded yeah. to core. And and for those, when you look back at what premier racing was about, it's a, it was it was showcasing the best. And it was for the, for those obviously not the grade ones or the or the big the big big handicaps, but the lesser meetings. The point of of what premier racing was going to do for them was to make sure that they stand out on the calendar a bit more. So you know there there are lots there there is a very big program of races and defining where you can go with those sort of handicappers there's lots of options so being able to say well actually because it's a premier meeting we're going to put a bit of prize money boost so what you can sort of 
almost guarantee in a way that because there's a bit more prize money, it will be a little bit more competitive. You'll have a bigger field because people will be aware of those opportunities. So they're the ones that hit, and I think crucially as well, that mid-tier, that's where a lot of owners are probably on a bit of a balancing act. It's, we're not talking about the cool malls of the world who, you know, if they win a race like the Dewhurst, then it's the prize money is not mm. important. It's the it's the breeding rights and stuff like that. And the huge owners who can invest and have that have that luxury of being able to invest without the pressure of, of having to turn over a profit or at least get close to it. But those owners who are struggling a little bit, being able to have less opportunities for a good pr prize money for a horse, that makes you think a twice about whether you can continue to invest in the game or b whether you should be looking further afield. And the biggest concern here is going to be that this is not the end of the matter, but rather the tip of the iceberg, that we might see other racecourse groups and other racecourses follow suit. And indeed, that the pressure on racing's finances will grow, not diminish. And, and, and not least one of the contributing factors to that is the less money you have to invest in the product, the weaker the product is likely to become, and you enter into a cycle which is very hard to arrest. I think that cycle has been the case for quite a while now, and, mm. and yeah, you're, you're completely right, and, and it's just another alarm bell for the sport, and it, it, there's, there's some serious change that's needed if you are going to counter things like this happening. Thanks very much, James. We will now move on to a slightly happier matter, because it is... Uh, the week that ends in the greatest steeplechase in the world. It did the greatest race in the world and one of the, the, the finest sporting occasions known to man. It is the Grand National at Aintree. And last year's winner, Corrick Rambler, uh, is bidding to bring the double up for Scotland's Lucinda Russell. Um, however, Corrick Rambler heads a very, very thin home challenge. Just a handful of of British trained horses guaranteed to get a run, almost certain to be fewer than 10 in the race, albeit the race now is uh, reduced to 34 runners. Uh, DJ, what do you make of the Grand National field and the, and the paucity of that home challenge, which is kind of being propped up by, uh, by the uh, significant figure of Cora Crambler? Yeah, um, there was a, a bit of light at the end of the tunnel there uh, yesterday when it, it looks as though uh, Ronnie Bartlett said that neither Galvin or Statler would run unless there was good, I think, good to soft in the going description. So the likelihood of good to soft in the going description, I'd say, is about as likely as firm being in the going description. There's going to be no good in it. Uh, so I'd say you can take out Statler and Galvin. Certainly Galvin. I know Gordon doesn't want to run Galvin again on really deep ground. So I'd say he's definitely out. Maybe Willie will run Statler. I don't know. But likelihood is that you have two Irish challengers out that will probably bring maybe one or possibly two British, uh, more British Raiders into the race. But um, look, it's this is what's happened. We knew this was going to happen. Well, I certainly did. The minute it was it was reduced to 34 runners, I said this is going to be the Irish Grand National. We're going to have two Irish Grand Nationals, certainly in 2024, possibly 2025, 26. For a few years, it's going to have more Irish runners than English runners. And obviously the quality of the fair is quite high, but the chances of a fairy tale are quite low. And that's what I've said time and time again. But the one thing I will say about the meeting in general, it's going to be as good an entry festival as I can remember in the last decade, certainly two decades. And um, what we've got now is we've got almost a perfect storm of, of Gordon Elliott and Henry de Bromhead tackling entry because they're kind of realizing maybe that punches 10 might not be as easy to pick up grade one wins or might not be as easy to pick up prize money when you're running against three, four, possibly five Willie Mullins runners in, in grade ones. And Gordon is sending basically all his A-listers, probably apart from Tihupu, who would probably wait for, for Punchestown, uh, but he's sending all his A-listers to, to Aintree. Henry de Bromwell could even run the likes of Slade Steel. He's obviously got Manil Indo in the, in the Grand National Envoy, Elena is running. So you've got kind of the, the second and third best Irish trainers Tackling Dan Skelton, Paul Nichols, Nicky Henderson basically coming back with the team that didn't go to Cheltenham. So I know that the meeting in general is all about the Grand National, but this this year it's not. It's about really top, top notch grade ones. And that entry bowl on, on Thursday, when you've got Jerry Colomb versus Shishkin versus King George winner and Hewitt, like it really is a quality meeting this year. And I think we can really look forward to competitive racing. Very, very few odds on shots in the grade ones. Like we're going to have so few odds on shots in the grade ones, and that's going to be a breath of fresh air. And then you're going to obviously build up to the crescendo in the Grand National. So I think 
it's obviously disappointing to start a week with a prize money reduction, which is which is horrific, really. But uh, I think this is one week of the year where it's going to be a good news story for jump racing because I think this entry festival is going to be the best three days of entry, certainly I can remember in the last two decades or so. Uh, let's hope so. One of the factors which is certainly going to have an impact, though, is the weather. And you, you already mentioned that Galvin and Statler, two unlikely runners in the Grand National, as a consequence of this perpetual rain. Um, it looks like uh, we could have heavy going um, for the national and, and for the entry meeting more generally with a lot of rain due to start this week and very little sort of real drying weather after that. Um, well, let's, let's, let's first of all focus on the impact that might have on the Grand National other than the, the two horses we've named who are unlikely to turn up. I mean, we could be looking at a, a sort of a Grand National being run in truly quite desperate ground, DJ. Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure you were up early and you're reading Chris Cook's front runner this morning, uh, which is always a terrific read. And uh, I don't know how, like I do a column every Saturday and trying to come up with an idea every week for a column is really hard. Chris does it every single day. And I always, the first, like this sounds really bad. Usually you should probably kiss your wife or something. But the first thing I do is click into my emails and read Chris Cook's uh, front runner. And today he came up with a really clever piece where he basically explains all the heavy ground Grand Nationals and the, the heading was, I think, a 10 minute national learning the lessons from times when the mud flew at entry. And you go through it and you say to yourself, holy God, like anything can basically happen when we've got a heavy ground, heavy ground, ground Grand National. And the one thing from the whole email, which absolutely I was flabbergasted about, that I remember obviously Red Marauder winning the race. I remember, you know, blowing wind remounting and Ruby and, and McCoy basically, you know, having that race for, for third. But the one thing I couldn't believe, it was a two horse race with 10 fences to go. So like with 10 fences to go, to go, there was only two horses left in the race. So I obviously knew it was a match race from probably the second last or third last. I can't believe it was actually a match race from, from 10 out which basically there was a huge possibility we could have no finisher that year. So I don't think that's going to happen this year because, you know, the, the quality of horses that are in the race at the moment are quite classy. Like a lot of them have been running in grade ones. A lot of them are, are physically and mentally really stubborn, like, and they will keep going. So I don't think the chances of, you know, having your two, three, four finishers is likely. I'd say we're probably looking at somewhere between maybe, you know, seven and, and, and 10, that kind of area, I'd say, for finishers. Um, if it is absolutely really bottomless and then you're looking at the horses that kind of really absolutely love the mud and, and horses that are really going to cope and the one horse who's really kind of pricked my ears and opened my eyes in the last week and he's actually trained in Britain would you believe is Galia de la Toe from the Dan Skelton stable which could basically win him the trainer's title I think if he wins the Grand National he's going to win the trainer's title and I just go through her form and you know, she basically needs a bottomless. She ran a cracker in the in the classic chase at, at Warwick. And she's just a type of, of mare that could really take to the Grand National. Obviously, it's a big if, and uh, you never know whether they will or not. But uh, she's one that could really excel in the conditions, whereas others, and there's a lot of kind of fancy type of horses that mightn't just be as good in those testing conditions. And, and I actually interviewed Paul Carberry uh, 25 years on from Bobby Joe. I visited him uh, last week for a feature that's going in, I think, on Grand National Day. And the one th thing that he said, which I thought was really interesting, he thinks actually nowadays in the Grand National, it's an advantage going into the race for the first time. He thinks that sometimes it's a negative if you've ran in the race before, because he made the point that King John's Castle, who was really quirky, he rode in the race, to, he rode in the Grand National to finish second one year, came back the following year, and he said the horse didn't want to know the next year. And he's very much of the opinion that first time is probably the time to strike, like we saw with Cora Trammler last year. And, and maybe that's the case this year as well. But as you said, the conditions are going to play a big part. And uh, I'm kind of leaning towards Galia de la Tau now. The uh, profile of the race has changed a lot, not just because of some of the changes to the distance, to the... To the, to the um, mm number of runners, but also because of the, 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 the sort of cam the revolutionary campaign of people like Emmett Mont. Um, we're now seeing a different type of horse competing in the race. Yeah, I mean, firstly, on the ground, I mean, the key point on the ground is 
I still remember in December the Beach of Chase at Aintree on the national course. That was the most bottomless ground I have think I've seen in a long, long time. There were only five finished. It was below RPR standard time by 57 seconds. Mm. Uh, 2.2, 2.4 2 on the going stick. Unbelievable. So the fact it's rained constantly since, I mean, I think it's going to be an absolute grueling test. And yeah, I think there's a lot, I think there's like the perfect storm what's happened with the Grand National is because the field size has been reduced. So the emphasis on quality is already bigger. Um, but I think as well, the last few years and the changes that have been made, you've seen quite a few national winners who they sort of made sense. Korak Rambler last year, a great run at Cheltenham, looked like he, he was he was always a grand national winner in waiting that day. Noble Yates won it as a novice. That's, that's mm. surprising. It shows that the, the challenge of the race perhaps wasn't as steep as it once was. Manila Times was almost set for the race. Tiger Roll, two years on the bounce. So I think the way people have looked at the grand national is it possibly isn't the, the great big lottery it once was. If the last few years would suggest that actually, you know what, if you've got a horse that can jump well and you think they're going to stay well, it's obviously not as long as it used to be. I think people have targeted it a bit more because they feel that the the element of surprise perhaps has been weakened a little bit over time and possibly will be even more so with the current changes. So it's no surprise that trainers are looking at this race a little bit differently and it's it's not so much of a an, an afterthought or it was it's never normally an afterthought but so, so much of the horse sort of ends up there. It's more, you know what, a horse like Vanilli is a really good example. Second last year, ran a good race, and this whole season has been geared around it. This whole season has been made. And, and you get to the National itself, and you're like, well, this horse has definitely got a chance, and it's already a leading contender. So, yeah, that's 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 a big change. I think it's going to be interesting this year with, with the field size reduced. And what's your selection at this point? Well... Uh, Dan Skelton was mentioned there for the trainer's title. I think it'd be interesting to see what Willie Mullins can do because he probably needs to win the Grand National to have any chance of being champion trainer. Um, and I was on the Mr. Incredible train last year, which sums up my typical Grand National success, which lasts about four, four fences, if that. Um, I was impressed by... I mean, I think he's a horse that's definitely going to be fine on the conditions. Didn't run too badly in the Midlands Grand National, which is the ultimate um, of of um, wet ground and, and soggy grounds. Um, so Mr. Incredible each way for me. Okay. Uh, I have backed uh, Meeting of the Waters Antipost, but if you want a more insightful guide to the Grand National, you might want to check out our brand new race cards on the Racing Post app. Uh, over the last couple of years, data scientists and betting experts at the Racing Post have been working on a revolutionary new race card called Smart View. This basically looks at a totally different way, a reimagining of the race card with form figures and um, uh, race records expressed in attribute scores rather than in the traditional fashion. What's really clever about this, I think, is that the science behind it is not as simple as the race card might make it look to be. In fact, there's some incredibly clever stuff going on. You can read more about it on the Racing Post app where you'll also find uh, the Smart View card. Um, last year, uh, my, my partner, who's never previously based uh, Grand National selections on anything other uh, than names and colours, used it to select Coric Rambler. Maybe you'll also uh, use it to find this year's winner. To tell you a little bit more about that, uh, here's our betting editor, Keith Melrose. Fancy a bet, but find it confusing? Do not fear. Smart View is here to help you. We've taken the traditional race card and removed all the jargon and abbreviations which can be daunting for newcomers. The result is a race card that means making informed choices and picking winners is easier than ever. Our racing experts and data scientists have created an algorithm that puts everything a seasoned punter would consider into the attribute bars you see on the race card and assesses each runner with an overall score out of 100. Uh, welcome back. We're going to cover some more big entry stories and we're going to start first of all by briefly touching on the changes to this year's race. As already mentioned, uh, the number of runners is down to 34 from 40. That's the most obvious change, but also there's a, a number of others, including moving uh, the start closer to the first fence. Um, one of the most interesting angles, though, I think this year is the communications work. Uh, the sport is doing around its welfare record uh, ahead of the race. Uh, they launched last week a new campaign called Horsepower, accompanied by some very striking uh, posters 
illustrating the sport's record on welfare and its commitment to thoroughbreds. Uh, James, this uh, campaign, we'll show some posters on the screen now, got a fantastic reception, um, really full-throated support from the sport. And I think people really um, appreciated the fact that the sport was taking a, uh, a front foot yeah. forward stance on welfare, not being defensive, not being reactive, but going out and telling people um, who might uh, only have a once a year interest in the sport, the sort of commitment racing has to its animals. Yeah, I've looked through this, the website for, for a few hours, and a oh, few hours, but for an hour or so, and, and I had a look at all the different parts and a really good section of FAQs. Um, so all the questions that somebody who, I mean, we've, we've, we've had this job for a while. We always meet people who have questions about racing and, mm. and not questioning, but they're curious about certain elements to do to do with it and this website clearly outlines some of the uncomfortable questions that we have to answer you know what happens to horses on the race course when there are fatalities what happens to, to horses after after racing and and it deals with that and it has it's important to be transparent and it's good to confront these things Definitely. head on rather than sort of shy away you know, sometimes, as sometimes racing has in the past a little bit from some of the more yeah exactly um, more more controversial aspects of the sport and it's important to be transparent and it's it's important from the sport not to appear that it has something to hide because a lot of the time it doesn't it's just been pretty poor really in many ways to actually be forthcoming and saying this is what we're about mm. this is what it's got and look this is a great campaign it's um it's a, it's good that that it's so easy to find i mean um we live in a time now where there's a huge issue of mis misinformation especially on social media it's a huge problem it's it's much mm. bigger than racing it's it's general so being able to have something that someone can quickly google we, we live in a google world now don't we someone has a question they google it you don't ask you google and and being able to be able to quickly find this sort of information and go okay fine that's what's important because we watched um it being discussed on luck on sunday yesterday and a lot of this was led by focus groups and research and they the discussion was about the middle ground, which I don't particularly like the phrase, but it, it is the, what's true. There's a lot of people who don't call themselves racing fans, who don't necessarily dislike racing, but they might go time to time. And there are times where, like the Grand National last year, where, let's face it, at times it was quite unpleasant to watch. There were lots of fallers, there were sort of loose horses running it. That makes people question things. And being able to say, OK, you've got a question, here's the answer to those questions, that's a really good thing to do. And I'm great that this, the whole industry has come together to back it. What a nice time it is when the industry comes together and <laughs> sing off the same hymn sheet. It doesn't happen often, does it? It doesn't happen <laughs> often. It doesn't happen often at all. Um, another sort of key story for Angel this year is going to be the form of Nicky Henderson's horses. Um, there was a tremendous interview with yeah. him in today's Racing Post by Lewis Porteous. Uh, fantastic and insightful soul bearing as it so often is uh, with Nicky Henderson talking about um, the agony of yeah. the his disastrous Cheltenham Festival and also Constitution Hill's um, suspected colic and, and the treatment around that including the, 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 yeah. the brilliant little detail that Nicky uh, put him into the veterinary hospital under the name of Henry uh, <laughs> a bit like a rock star checking into yeah. a hotel under a shim name um, I also imagine he had the sort of sunglasses on as he came in as well. And, <laughs> and that's probably, yeah. yeah. Um, thankfully, Constitution Hill back yeah. home uh, it seems to be on the road to recovery, although we won't see him until next season. But, but some of Nicky Henson's other big stars are heading uh, to Aintree. And by God, he is desperate for a turnaround in his fortunes. Yeah, first time of uh, Nicky Henson train at the Chatham Festival since 2008. Mm. Um, pretty staggering. And he has, I mean, we talk a lot about Ireland, Ireland dominance and, and Willie Mullins' dominance. Nicky Henson has got those superstar names that really are at the absolute pinnacle. So Gino could well be, and I think the vibes about him were that this horse could be the next big thing from Seven Barrows. Shishkin, we obviously know um, his season has been one hell of a roller coaster and it continues to go i'd love to see shishkin win at aintree again um and then john bon who is this great horse with a great reputation who's finally stacking up to two mile two and mm -hmm. a half miles in the melling so really really interesting and it'd be fascinating to see what the, what the punters do because 
There is still this question mark. It has been a, there's been quite a bit of time since the Cheltenham Fest. We had a winner at Ludlow last week, which looked very good. And there's been a few runners. The signs are looking good for an Nick Henderson revival. So that's very interesting. Yeah, um, DJ touched on some of the things. Paul Nichols and Dan Scout. This is a cracking title rivalry. I'm so excited. I, I really enjoy this because it is is the sort of the master and the sort of the new prodigy. You know, it's coming together mm. and and. Dan Skelton in the paper this week was saying, well, I wasn't even aware of, of the, the trainer's title until the Ryanair, until I got told. I was the person that told him that. And I still remember his eyes sort of lit up and went, oh, yeah. I've, he, I could see that through his face the moment he realised he could be champion trainer. Um, and it's going to be fascinating to see what they do. That melling chase where you've got John Bond in there, but you've also got Pick Dory and Protectorat. That is going to be a huge race because... They try and play it down a little bit. They try and play it down a little bit, but they both are very well, competitive. We are we're, we're teeing up so a Titanic much. tussle between Nichols and Skelton, but there's every possibility, DJ, that Willie Mullins is going to come along <laughs> and spoil it at the last minute. His odds have collapsed for the title. Yeah. He's entered a bunch of horses at air. He's 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 really thinking about it, isn't he? Yeah, I think. I would say that the entries at air and the entries in the Bet365 Gold Cup at Sandown, I think they're Grand National based. I think it's a case of, God, if we actually won the Grand National, wouldn't it be a shame not to have anything at air at RS uh, Sandown where we could actually win a title? So I think it's based on the Grand National. So look, he's got a cracking chance to win the Grand National. He spoke of meeting in the waters. He's, uh, you know, James is fancy, he's trained by Willie Mullins. The second favourite, I am Maximus, is trained by Willie Mullins. He's got Capadano. So he has got decent chances so I think it's it's a case of if we win the Grand National let's just have these in here and just see what happens my guess would be if he doesn't win the Grand National age he doesn't go particularly well for, for Willie that he won't have any runners at air or won't have any runners at sand there. that would be my guess and that they will instead run a punches time but it'll be interesting to see what does happen and uh, the Henderson thing is fascinating and um, it's obviously infuriating from his point of view but from Punter's point of view, it's a real head scratcher as well because Easy Peasy won the other day at Ludlow and, and won quite convincingly, like, like was kind of evens and would have been one to two if the stable form hadn't been the way it is. But then like he's had a few run absolute shockers as well. I think he's had four runners in the last fortnight. Like the bomber listen was really well back from tens, I think, into nine to two at Wincanton. Ran an absolute shocker to Bomber Liston. Touchy feely fell at uh, Wincanton. And then he had one runner at Exeter on Sunday. And it was Jamura in a kind of a two-mile seven handicap hurdle. Jamura was the first horse beaten. He couldn't move after halfway. Like it's so it's it's really worrying to know that like some of them are still running really bad, but yet he's had a winner. And I think we're going to know very early in the Grand National meeting if if Henderson's horses are back on song because Sergino runs in the second race on on Thursday. I think it's at twenty past two and. My opinion personally is that Sergino is an absolute cut above every other juvenile and that if the stable were humming and just say he had three out of his last four horses had won, I would happily back Sergino at four to seven or one to two. I think he's that superior to the likes of Cardisi. Um, and even Calif de Berlay, who I think is a, going to turn out to be a cracking novice chaser next season, might just be a little bit too much from this season, but I think Sergino, from what I saw at, at, at Cheltenham and even at Kempton, I have to say, when, when he won over Christmas, I thought he, he looked a real, real star. So uh, we'll know at 20 past two on uh, on Thursday whether the Henderson team are back. If, if Sergino bowls in, it's going to be some week. We can find out more about the uh, form of Nicky Henderson's yard and indeed uh, what he and his team went through at that extraordinary Cheltenham Festival. Uh, in today's paper or with Members Club Ultimate where you'll find uh, Lewis Porteous' interview with uh, Nicky Henderson. Uh, with a Members Club Ultimate subscription you can also uh, gain access to David Jennings' morning routine, uh, Chris Cook's The Front Runner, uh, which is an absolutely unmissable daily email uh, from the Racing Writer of the Year, is another exclusive to our subscribers. Uh, to find out more about a Members Club subscription and the current special offer we have running, uh, we've got this ad. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we turn now to the tragic story uh, from Australia last week where 23-year-old Italian-born jockey Stefano Perci uh, 
died after suffering a fatal fall uh, while riding at Canberra on March 20th. Uh, Kerchi had been based in Britain since 2018, riding initially for fellow countryman Marco Botti and have recorded over 100 winners. Um, tributes this week poured in from across the globe, but particularly uh, from his colleagues and friends in Newmarket, who described him universally as a talented, charismatic and popular member of the racing community. Uh, James, you've been talking to some of those colleagues this week. It, it's, it's always a tragedy uh, whenever a, a jockey uh, faces such a, uh, a terrible injuries or, or dies in the sport. But what's really come across with uh, uh, Stefano's story is just how popular he was. And indeed, what a, what a wonderful career he had ahead of him. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, some of the comments and the tributes were, were very touching, you know, sort of saying he was very smiley, always had a good joke. Um, Brighten up every place he'd walk into was what Amy Murphy said, who he rode for um, at the end of last season. And very true as well that, that his career was really taking off. Um, the Australia opportunity was one, was a huge opportunity for him and he was, he'd ridden a couple of winners out there and was enjoying it. But towards the end of the season here, his, his career was really accelerating. He had a big winner at the St Ledger meeting. Um, in a handicap um, where he beat Ryan Warner less in a photo finish, um, he had a first. Uh, he had a group group one ride at the end of the season in the in the last group one of the season, the, the Futurity Trophy, and yeah, he, he was so sort of Marco Potti, who he was very very close to, who described him as part of a family. He was saying only a few weeks after um, going to Australia, he was already excited about riding Great Generation, who'd ridden. In, in France, uh, who was going to ride in France in the French Guinea. So it, it's always extremely sad when these things happen, but this was a young lad who was, as you say, so popular. But also his career was, was going so well, and, and um, it's, it's been touching to see how the community have, have come together to, to appreciate it, because it is, it's always extremely sad, and, and you shouldn't treat these things as, as, as one, really. But when incidents like this happen, it just is another reminder at the risk of this sport that, that the jockeys have on a daily, weekly basis and, 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 and what can happen and the tragedies that can happen. It's, it's extremely sad, but... Um, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. And, and it should be mentioned as well that um, another example of the racing community coming together, there's been a GoFundMe set yes. up to support uh, his family um, that, that's raised a tremendous amount of money. We'll put a link to that yeah. in the description. Um, we had another reminder um, yesterday of just how tough racing can be um, when Aidan Coleman announced his retirement. At age just 35, he suffered a really terrible knee injury um, last year and has had to concede that his recovery is not going to get him anywhere near uh, the level of fitness required uh, to race ride again. Um, I thought he, he, he announced it on Lock on Sunday. I thought he spoke fantastically. Um, he, he did himself enormous credit. Uh, but it's, it's just a reminder of, of the, 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 the risks that all jockeys run every time they, they, they swing a leg over a horse. Absolutely. And, and I think sometimes in the, in the world we live in where you see constantly on a daily basis jockeys having to deal with all sorts of nonsense on social media, people forget the real genuine risk that they're in the life the life-changing things that, that happen um, in this sport. I mean, hearing him recall the injury and, and sitting at, at the hospital for five hours about mm. pain relief, it's, it was pretty horrendous. And, oh, truly, yeah. And, yeah. I mean, shows a lot about his character, but the first thing he does is already think, you know, I, I want to get back to it. And, and, and he was quite emotional. I, I thought he spoke fantastically well in, in that almost he devoted all his life and career to race riding, being a jockey, and almost now sort of sitting back and going, okay, what next? He hadn't thought about that because he was so focused on his riding career and then on to his recovery. Um, yeah, I spoke to a number of trainers who worked with him. Um, Emma Lavelle, of course, had some brilliant things to say with Paisley Park, um, the magical relationship they had. And I think I must have watched that stairs hurdle back three or four times at least because it was just so good. And also he's, he's a, lot of a, a lot of the trainers are saying he's really, really intelligent jock as well. Mm. So Quite, play quite an important role behind the scenes. Um, Anthony Honeyball, who Aidan Coleman's ridden for throughout Anthony Honeyball's career and all the success he's had, um, was saying Sam Brown, a horse who was an absolute mud lover, Aidan Coleman's kept saying to him, 
you should try this horse on better ground. He might be okay, he might be okay. Anthony Honeywell saying, no, you're, you're talking rubbish. Goes and pulls off his biggest win at Aintree on good ground. So yeah. um, it happens and it's good to have jockeys like that. And, and it shows that their experience and their, their knowledge is, is not just on the racetrack, it's at home as well. And so I'm sure he'll be a success. He, he's a, he's a, he's a He's a very clever, clever man. He's had so much success and great to see that all the trainers that have worked for him speak so highly of him. Yeah, DJ, um, Aidan Coleman, I'm certain he'll go on and have great success in whatever he chooses to do, whether it's media or elsewhere in racing, because he does, he does speak so well and, uh, and clearly has a fantastic understanding of the sport. Um, but let's just, before we sort of turn to his future, let's just, just reflect um, on his career a little bit. Yeah, I always thought, uh, you know, he, he was one of the most stylish jockeys in the weighing room, um, you know, his achievements on the track obviously speak for itself. What did you make of uh, Aidan's riding career? Yeah, he was he was an artist, I suppose, um, in that his style on a horse, you could always pick him out in a race. If you didn't, if you hadn't looked at a race before and you could, you could pick out Aidan. And there's only a few jockeys that you can kind of do that, which you can always, you could have always done it with Paul Carberry, Ruby Walsh, Harry Cobden. There's a there's a kind of a handful of jockey that jockeys that you can always point at in a race and, and he was one of them. Um, I actually feel so sorry for him because if you think of it, uh, he waited until 2018 for his first Grade One success and that was on Paisley Park in the Long Walk. Like he seems to, I know he was only 35, but he has been around a long time. And to have to wait till 2018, he even said on the show yesterday, he said he was almost embarrassed it had taken him that long to get his first grade one success and you kind of in recent years we kind of associate him with kind of bigger races and, and grade ones and the reason i feel sorry for him is because he obviously waited so long in his career to get on really good horses and now jp jp McManus has kind of his his best ever team in ireland and england and obviously aiden was riding john bond and you know a couple of different kind of jp horses and he was kind of half assuming the the role of jp's rider in, in, in England since Barry Garrity retired and Mark Walsh was kind of riding him in Ireland and he kind of I'd say he can see he can almost feel it uh, in the last couple of years that you know if things kind of continue to go really well for me I'm going to be riding so many good JP horses in these great ones and I think that's probably the part that, that hurts him the most obviously you know it's great for him to get out in one piece and, and obviously it's, it's the right decision but There'll be a part of him that will say, if I wasn't so unlucky with this specific injury, I could be riding so many good horses. I could be riding John Bond on Friday at Aintree and a lot of other JP horses because that JP team, it's it's just soaring at the moment. And it's a case of grade one. It's, it's all about quality at the moment with JP. We, we kind of associate him over the years with kind of handicaps and, you know, these big gambles maybe pulled off and big handicaps over the years. But... You go through JP's list of horses and you see the the, the Cheltenham he had not so long ago with, with so many quality horses winning. Uh, that is a proper job now. And Aidan would have been riding a lot of those horses. But, you know, a really good career, really good jockey, really good guy. You know, Kevin, his brother over in Ireland, is, is a really, really shrewd operator. And, you know, owners who have horses with Kevin speak really, really highly of him. So I'm sure Aidan will have some part to play there, whether he goes down the train route himself or whether he goes to help Kevin, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, a really shrewd operator, probably a really shrewd family. And uh, more luck to him. Hopefully the, the second stage of his career is as successful as his first. One last note on this rather sombre subject before we move on. Um, the family of Graham Lee, who uh, suffered life-changing spinal injuries in a fall uh, late last year, last week announced the launch of the Graham Lee Racing Club. Um, this fantastic initiative is just £17 uh, a year to join. I've already signed up. And if you'd like to join in uh, as well with the fantastically named uh, We've Got This, uh, we'll put a link to join in the description. Um, if you'd like to uh, support Graham and his family, please do uh, check it out. Uh, that's all we've got time for this week, I'm afraid, which means we don't have time to talk about Frankie de Torre's incredible six time at Santa Anita, or indeed uh, Winx's only fall selling for 10 million Australian dollars uh, this morning. But if you'd like to find out about all of that and all of uh, today's stories in more detail, do check out the Racing Post website and mobile app. Um, finally, it's my duty to pick this week's front page story and in the week 
of the Grand National, you might imagine there's only one story that could grace our front page. However, I think that whenever a jockey loses uh, their life in racing on the race course, uh, it's a tragedy that unites the sport and its followers uh, wherever they might be. So this week's front page story is uh, the tragic death of Stefano Kirchi. Um, thank you very much for joining us this week. Thank you very much to my panellists, James Stevens and David Jennings. David, you're going to be over in uh, Liverpool. You're, you're going to be hosting uh, Good Morning Entry on Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Is that correct? Yeah, God, I'm an awful job, don't I? What did I do to deserve this awful life? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, we are Thursday, Friday and Saturday morning, half eight. And on Thursday morning, what a panel we have lined up. We have Ruby Walsh, we have Johnny Deneen, we have Matt Williams, and we've been giving away loads of money courtesy of Paddy Power as well and Finders Keepers. So imagine Johnny Deneen, Ruby Walsh and Matt Williams on the same couch with silly old me asking them stupid questions. But tune in at half eight every day of the Grand National Meeting at Aintree uh, Thursday, Friday and Saturday. I can't wait. Brilliant. That is absolutely appointment viewing. Uh, also appointment viewing this week is In The Know, which will have Paul Keeley and Tom Segal on every day, uh, Wednesday to Friday, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And just to top it all off, we then have the Morning Post at 10 a.m. on Grand National Morning. Uh, so a must-watch diet of Racing Post shows coming up. And of course, uh, fantastic Grand National build-up alongside all the other big stories in racing in the Racing Post newspaper and on our digital platforms over the next week. Please do join us again next Monday where we'll be looking back on what I'm sure is going to be a brilliant entry festival. Until then, goodbye.